Let's get started. Let's get started so we can give uh, give Margaret a time. Melissa, they good to see everyone. If you haven't had a chance to get some food that, that Faye brought in, take your time now. Go ahead and get it. But let's go through the uh, church wide announcements real quickly on this. Um, I, do have, I have to tell you, we are going to be hearing music today. Max Tucker has a boom box right on the other side of that wall right there, so uh, oh. we're, we're going to see how that goes. We might be serenaded this morning, okay, so, well. so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, take a look at Darren DeMint's um, Preparing for Worship. Very interesting. I, some, I'm, I never think about what he wrote about today. I think you might be interested. But, uh, take a look. We have, um, let's see, um, we have on chancel today, Margaret. And Jean's grand, uh, is it grandson? Son? Yes, yes. yes. And I want to know. <laughs> Which one? I want to know if Jimmy Tyler Brashear is Jim. Is Jim? Is, the, is your? Is that? Is it Jimmy Tyler Brashear Elementary School? Any relation to your Brashear? Jimmy Brashear was. I used to get phone calls. <laughs> I would call him Jimmy, and I would get phone calls. And obviously, it was a black person. And. Uh, those days, and uh, they would come and talk to Jimmy Brashear. And uh, I began to understand Jimmy Brashear was the head of the colored schools. She had a job nobody much cared about, but she was trying to educate in the Dallas school system. And uh, they should have named the school after him, they did. Okay. Uh, because my, my daughter was older than the uh, old Sanger Harris, Whiskas. Complicated. Anyway, she was serving the Jimmy Brashear team. Okay. And, and she, and well, I thought I just thought there might be a connection. You being Jim Brashear, but anyway, okay, I got you now. They're, they're, uh, no, no relation, but I, I was in the background. The anyway, look for Eric. Their their grandson will be on his hands over there. Okay, so on page eight um, is everything about Easter and Holy Week uh, and sunrise services next Sunday on TP Hill. I hope they have a better, clearer day than today. Monday services on Thursday. So uh, you'll see um, Easter worship next Sunday, of course. Flowering cross. You can get your picture taken out front. Well, it's always a good thing to do. And today is, uh, I think, the order lilies by today. They say on page nine. Uh, Linton playlist on Spotify. And this is about Charlie Fuller, also on page nine, and his sidekick. So uh, we'll, uh, we're glad that Charlie is with us on this. Eclipse party on page 10 uh, on April 8th. Uh, parenting and the Enneagram. So that's on page 10 as well. That ought to be interesting. Now, Rachel Olney is hired as our receptionist. And her mother, Lisa Olney, used to be in this class a long time ago. So uh, that's, that's interesting. Uh, women of Wilshire are busy. Uh, you'll see on page 11 with uh, book club, brown bag club, and um, mahjong. So uh, pretty, pretty impressive there. And I gotta see this coming soon. The Gospel of Aretha Franklin starts on April 3rd. That's on yes. page 11. I want to I want to attend that. Um, request from the History Committee on page 12. If you've got some old books there. They're looking for cookbooks. Um, they're looking for spring youth retreats coming up, and ushers and readers are always needed. If you have time, do that. That's a great one. Rhonda Walton is our uh, I am Wilshire. Uh, for today, and she's in the next she's in the Epiphany class right behind us, um, and, and is a retired physician. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, and also the um, this this I want to attend on the 14th for sure. On the back, on the back page yes. is um, uh, the deep roots of racism in the Christian Church, and on Sunday, Mark Wingfield is doing a web a webinar a live webinar for the Baptist News Global. And that's something I, I, I would definitely want to attend, and um, that's, that's going to be really good. Is there any other church-wide announcements we have? I know we have several out. I know I've heard that Diana Early is out with Road to Resurrection and Susie McLaughlin, maybe others. But is there any other church-wide announcements that we need to talk about before we give this to Margaret? If not, Margaret, it's all yours. Thank okay. you. And Jean, thank you for coming as well. We appreciate it. Thank you all for having me again. Um, and today's lesson, at first I thought I was just going to focus on Elizabeth, and I thought that's that's a lot, and then uh, Dennis reminded me it was Zechariah and Elizabeth, but as you read this passage, 
it's so intertwined with Mary's. I mean, you know, Mary's in there too. So we have to talk about all three as we look at this passage today. And um, I, um, I love the way Luke just intertwines these stories and has such an emphasis on the women and their role in leadership in uh, these events. I thought of some titles for this lesson. It could be In the Fullness of Time, uh, as um, Paul reminds us, In the Fullness of Time, God brought forth his son. Or it could be A Pregnant Pause, <laughs> or Pregnant with Meaning. And I've always thought that grandparents, especially grandmothers, have a way of turning any conversation into, within about 10 minutes, into something about their grandchild. And so today, I'm going to share with you some good news that our family got this week. <coughs> our son sent us up a picture of a sonogram, Aww. and the couple that we thought was never going to have children, they had decided, you know, they didn't, you know, want children or whatever, whatever children they decide these days, have decided at age 40 and 39 that, that I know they will become parents. And so we're just thrilled about that news and um, sharing it with everyone we can. <laughs> it's another little boy, so we'll have three grandsons. But wow. <laughs> anyway, um, as we start our lesson today, let's think about maybe times that were in our lives that were really difficult for us and certainly difficult to understand God's presence with us and how, you know, maybe we've had prayers, we've prayed and prayed and they haven't been answered. Um, maybe, um, Maybe for you, it's you feel like the meaning has gone out of life, or people you trusted had let you down, or perhaps as we sometimes do as we age, we have thoughts of, well, my time is over, or things certainly didn't turn out the way I had thought or hoped they would. <laughs> or maybe your dark time is just the situation our world seems to be in now, or our nation seems to find itself and uh, I thought, I'm just reading, this is a book called See No Stranger that Heather is asking, will, will be asking our advocacy committee to read. And I wanted to read you something from, from the introduction. It's by Valerie Carr. And uh, just, it's in this introduction, she said, It was New Year's Eve 2016. My friend, Reverend William Barber, the second had invited me to speak at the Metropolitan AME Church, a historic black church in Washington, D.C. Like millions of Americans, and this shows her perspective and maybe certainly mine, but it was, I was still in shock over the results of our presidential election. I looked out at the crowded church and saw grief and anticipation in people's eyes. The future is dark, I said, but what if, what if this darkness is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? What if our America is not dead, but a country that is waiting to be born? What if the story of America is one long labor? What if all of our grandfathers and grandmothers are standing behind us now, those who survived occupation and genocide, slavery and Jim Crow, detentions and political assault? What if they are whispering in our ear, you are brave? What if this is our nation's greatest transition? So I thought, the womb rather than the tomb. Darkness can take many forms, and sometimes, as the Bible teaches us, it is the prelude to dawn. 
and there are things to learn in the darkness. Um, today our focus is on Luke um, 1, 5 through 80. That's a lot of passage to read. And as we think about it, let's, I didn't remind us of this, but our questions that, that this class has decided to uh, focus on as we study these different characters. Uh, so, I don't know if you can see those or not, but I feel like you're familiar with them. Um, a little about Luke. The first four verses, which are not our focus today, but the prologue is, um, it is a very, one very long, complex, classical Greek sentence. And it's unique in biblical writings, but it was common in Greek writings. And, but in verse 5, the author changes to a storytelling mode with a more Semitic or Hebrew flavor, using references from the Hebrew scriptures that were familiar to many of his hearers. Um, he had a... Luke has a strong emphasis on women and features three women in his birth narratives. Uh, that's Elizabeth, Mary, and Anna. Uh, Luke intertwines the birth narratives of John the Baptist and Jesus. And for instance, in the Annunciations, you have some similarities. The Annunciation, the Annunciation to Zechariah and to Mary. And just phrases that you'll recognize from both of them. He was troubled, she was much troubled, you know, when the angel visited. The angel said to him, and the angel said to her, do not be afraid, and identically to Mary, do not be afraid. And... This is the same angel talking to both of them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Gabriel. <laughs> the Gabriel, yes, um, and Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will bear a son, and you will name him, and to Mary, and you will name him. He will be great. To Mary, he will be great. Uh, the, and Zechariah said to the angel, and Mary said to the angel, to Zechariah, and replying, the angel said to him, and to Mary, and replying, the angel said to her. And then, yes, here's our answer. Gabriel, God, sent, and now, those words. And then to Mary, Gabriel, sent, God, and now. And that was recently pointed out to me, and I thought, that's very interesting, and... Um, I just thought I'd share it with you. <laughs> so, do we want to, does one person want to volunteer to read this, or do we want to? We'll, we'll split it up. Yeah, we'll split it up. So yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see how we want to split it up. I thought we'd read the whole passage and then go back and talk about the insights we gain from this. Um, somebody start and just read... Um, Let's read. Do somebody want to read the whole section up to the, the birth of Jesus foretold? That would be verses 5 through 25. Okay, thank you, Travis. <laughs> In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. 
But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah so said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is 89 years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be filled, fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did not come out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. Oh, I'm sorry, when he did come out, he could not speak to them. And they realized he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. Thanks. Anybody else want to pick that up there and read maybe I'll do the next section. through 38? In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his word and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb, and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth <coughs> month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Okay. Somebody else want to pick this up at 39? In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to Judean, a Judean town <coughs> in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. Mary was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Okay, and somebody else want to pick it and do the Magnificat? Yeah, I'll do that. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. <coughs> his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of the of their hearts, and he has brought down the powerful from their thrones, and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestor, 
to Abraham, Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. Okay, <laughs> we're getting there. So, <laughs> does anyone else want to pick up and read with verse 57? Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, None of your relatives has his name. Then they began motioning him to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue free. And he began to speak, praising God. Fear came over all the church, And all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. All who had heard them pondered them and said, What then will this child become? For indeed the hand of the Lord was with him. Okay, and let somebody finish up with Zechariah's song. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant, David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from old, that we would be saved from our enemies. <coughs> and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus, he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant to us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. Thank you all. Great job on that long passage. There is so much in here that, just so much richness in these verses. So. I will just let it flow as it will, as you all were, as, as the scriptures spoke to you. What are some of the insights that you gain from these passages? And I know they're very familiar to all of you. This is just a, a review of them. But some of the insights are... I think all the references to me of the Holy Spirit here, you know, but this is prior to, you know, the, the big... You know, the day with Peter, I guess, preaching or whatever. Uh, and I'd always assume, you know, that that came later, but, you know, this was acknowledged and talked about here and in other places, I'm sure. Oh, yes. But I've just missed it. But, you know. Yes. The, the Spirit is from everlasting to everlasting. Uh, I think we see the great outpouring in Acts that was promised. But, um, and I also, you talk about the Spirit with Elizabeth. It says she was um, filled with the Holy Spirit. And basically the same as the prophets of the, the Hebrew Scriptures were filled with the Spirit. And she prophesied at that moment, just as Anna <coughs> prophesies a little bit later uh, in, in Scripture when you read that. What else? I noticed that both Zechariah and Mary questioned this thing that they had been told, but there was no consequence for Mary. Right, and I think, you know, you, I wondered about that too. 
and is, is her questioning perhaps a little different in the bio, you know, the sim simply the biological aspect of it? How can this be since I'm a virgin? Yeah. Um, and then Zachariah's question, he wanted a sign. And so, in one sense, it seems like he's sort of being chastised for asking for that mm -hmm. lack of faith, but in the other, he asked for it, and he did get a sign. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't there another scripture that says that he uh, laughed? That Abraham. That's oh, a passage Abraham. of Abraham. Yeah. So yeah. some similarity yeah. there, though. Yeah. Uh, the age. The, yeah. Yes, the age. Uh, issue and so yes, the, I think Sarah laughed too. Doesn't it record yeah. that? Yeah, that, she that, <laughs> like I can imagine now. You know, really, God, now listen. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. You're right. <laughs> Uh, don't you think that most of us would probably be wondering also? Yes. So maybe that's maybe that's put in there so we can relate to it when we do the same thing. Right, right. It's like, you know, and uh, it's interesting when we think that, well, we're too old to do something. <laughs> and then we think about the people in Scripture like Moses, who really got started on his mission at 80 years old. I just can't even imagine. Joe I'm, Biden. <laughs> he needs to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> yes, he does. Many people make their greatest contributions in their older years. And uh, so. One of the things that struck me this week, I kind of thought about it all week, but one of the things that struck me was. From what my understanding is of timing, we are coming out of the 400 years of not hearing prophecies from God. And if God didn't prophesy, or it's not recorded, right. for 400 years, then I think it would be a surprise to hear from God. That's a that's a good point because we do talk about those silent years right. before you know the intertestamental period. There were certainly writings, some of the writings in the apocrypha were done during that time, but it is scholars often talk about that. Is you know another thing we might call during that pregnant pause of the four hundred years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, yes. Uh, and, and you know, when you waited for something for so long, one scholar that I read was talking about how though the people, many of the people were feeling that the events of the time pointed to a uh, more Im imminent coming of the Messiah that they were looking for and how they had defined Messiah. And so, um, but you know, when something you've longed for, for a long time, or you're hoping there would be good news, like in this case, a child, and you hoped for a long time, it's like you you really want to hear it again. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, have you ever been in a situation where you um, have a loved one that's ill, or maybe you were ill yourself, and the doctor comes out and brings you good news, and you just want to say, say it again, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Let me hear it again. Because this is what I prayed for, this is what I've hoped for, but I really, I, I just really want the validation again. And so I think we kind of identify that way. Uh, you know, did I hear it right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's a good point. You know, we, um, we have to assume that a year to them is like a year to us. Now, that yes. may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. We don't know. But I think by this time it's definitely true. Okay. You know, in the, in the way they were... Once again, it's an assumption. Yeah, right, right. But uh, I, I think you're right on that. Um, just my opinion. As a, an aside, we learned Thursday at the Ramadan dinner 
that Muslims believe the angel Gabriel dictated the entire Quran. So I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. And how could he have also said, well, that Christ is going to be uh, the Savior forever and forever, uh -huh. but then have also dictated the Quran? <laughs> Yeah. I had never heard that Gabriel was a human. Yeah, mm -hmm. me either. That was yeah. used to me. Yeah. And there are some, you know, common ancestors there. Uh, so. Margaret, I'm, I'm probably going to go to hell for this, but. The, uh, <laughs> uh, Don't say it. No. At least to me, to me, I, I just think it's ironic that Zachariah had the best excuse to talk his wife into going to bed with him and he couldn't tell her anything. I know. <laughs> You know, he obviously was one of the people in those days that could write, so maybe he wrote some right, so. love notes and left them on the refrigerator or something. Whatever they had. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, sometimes I think we need to see the humor. I mean, people in these days had a sense of humor, just like we have a sense of humor. And when I read that Sarah laughed, I think I would have laughed too. It's like, now that I am old and don't want to keep up with a toddler, <laughs> you've given me one. And I also think about, you know, Mary's um, Magnificat is, uh, has likenesses to Hannah's song of praise when she had been longing for a child and and she says that God has taken away my disgrace and and um, we'll talk about that in a second but I always think yeah he got to be about four years old and you decided you wanted to take him to church and give him to the pastor yeah. and to raise yeah. Yeah. can we do that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I do think also to talk about how it's interesting how you wonder how this idea evolved but I, about being barren and that being sort of a disgrace in that culture. We see it in the, the Old Testament all, several times. Um, and, you know, the scripture talks about children being a blessing, you know, and I think it's easy to say, well, this is a blessing, so the lack of this, this is God's favor to have children, and of course, children were important for many reasons in that culture, but um, it's easy to turn that around and say the lack of that blessing is God's disfavor, and I just I don't believe that. Well, I think there, I mean, we've talked about that too, like in sermons, heard Timothy even say um, something about the fact that people say, oh, I'm blessed, mm -hmm. you, I'm blessed. Yeah. So what does that mean to people you're talking to? Does that mean they're not? I think two things can be true at the same time. I mean, I think a person yeah, can feel can. blessed and that may just be the way they feel, whether or right. not it's a literal blessing. But I do think there are times, even today in my life, that there's periods of time when children is a big thing or not a big thing. And I'm in the age of grandparency, you know, all my friends are grandparents, and I'm not a grandparent. Right. And when I meet people who don't know me and they're, in, you know, you're in that circle, it's always about they make that assumption, just mm -hmm. like they did when I was childbearing age. Oh, you have children. You know what that's yes, like. Yes. Yes. No, I don't. <laughs> no. I and, know. and so yeah. there's that. Again, that timeline where you feel like, okay, I'm once again having to face this, or you yeah, feel like you're, you're right. out of you're place. Right. You're, you're out of the circle. And I appreciate all assume. of the things they're saying. I mean, I have siblings that have kids. I know what it's like to, to be an aunt. Um, and I know what it's like. I practically raised my niece with my sister, yeah, which is a yeah. mom. So I know all those things, and I appreciate them. And people make the assumption either that you have them. If you do appreciate it and you act like you yeah. know what's going on, yeah. they, they assume it's only because you had them. It's like, no, you, know, you can like yeah. children and understand them and their growth and development without being a mother. Right. But it's it's hard because I thought yeah, all that hard. was kind of and I'm glad you brought that up. Like, oh, I'm not yeah. a grandmother. Okay, yeah, excuse me. <laughs> just assume and, you know I thought the many times that I have gushed over other people's 
<laughs> pictures of grandchildren. Oh, isn't that precious? Oh, and then they think they do your favors. Oh, so I I thought, your favors. And I thought when I finally had a grandchild, I thought, well, I'm going to just show mm -hmm. a few pictures around too. Yes. <laughs> but I, but um, so yeah, it's a good. Don't you think because she was from a priestly line that people may have thought she had done something wrong? Well, that's exactly what people thought. You know, if people weren't blessed with either riches or good health or children. That they must have done, you know, like the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned, this person or his parents? You know, so the, uh, it's easy, it's kind of easy to make that leap, I guess, you know, when something is a, a blessing. And, you know, how many times have, have uh, we said something like, you know, when someone recovers from an illness, a child recovers, and we say, oh, God really answered that prayer, or what a blessing for the person whose child didn't recover, or whose loved one didn't recover, does that mean God is a blessing then? Or that God is withholding God's blessings from them? You know, it's an interesting thing that we, I think we have to be very cautious about, you know, uh, and how we, how we interpret what God is doing. One thing that I have always thought about this as many times God delays an answer to prayer that we're looking for you know that we would like answered immediately because God's will for our life is intertwined with his will for other people's lives and for salvation history you know we often forget that we are a part of God's overall plan. And so when God, it's hard to trust God's timing. <laughs> I mean, I think it is sometimes when it doesn't seem to fit into what we thought God had called us to, or we thought that things were going to be different and God would be faithful, but we have interpret that in our, in our will. You know, in the Bible, it, it, there used to be in several places, it says, just keep on praying. Mm -hmm. And boy, that's hard to do. You've been doing it for so many years. And yes. Think, well, I think I've just about worn that out. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> just keep on. Right. Just and you know, on. I always think about ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, you knock and the door shall be open to you. Sometimes it is, you know, it seems like we often interpret that as, you know, it's going to be immediate, but seeking is part of the growth process. You know, yes, yeah, sometimes we, I've had prayers just recently that I prayed in the morning and by evening they were answered. There are other prayers I've prayed for years and years, and maybe we grow more in the seeking those that take longer that we have to you know think a little bit more about what is God doing here and how is what God's calling me to do intertwined with maybe somebody else's prayers or God's salvation history so you know I think about that and I think about how the timing for Mary was unexpected, right? And the timing for Elizabeth was unexpected. But how they were all part of God's plan. So. Margaret, I think of, of the people in Egypt, you know, they, when they were there for 400 years, I think it would be very difficult for, for a second generation, much less, you know, eight generations or whatever it was, to, to pray for deliverance, um, and I, I think I, I might have given up. Yeah, yeah, and I think they had. You know, Moses didn't have an easy time <laughs> moving them forward 
many times in helping them to have faith when things looked bleak. But, you know, I always think we should talk about the patience of Moses more than the patience of Job. There were a few times, there, I think maybe twice we see Moses losing his temper a little bit. The first time was when he killed the, the Egyptian that was abusing a fellow Hebrew. The second time when he struck that rock, again, you know, to bring water, and he was angry about it. And I always thought, you know, it was a pretty harsh punishment <laughs> to not be able to go into the promised land. And the Bible does speak of that, is, you know, it connects that. But I also think his time of leadership was over. And if he had gone into the promised land, probably <laughs> Joshua wouldn't have been able to lead in the way that Joshua, that he needed to lead because people would have said, well, Moses didn't do it like that. <laughs> so, so again, God's timing and, you know, Moses might have been relieved that he didn't have to go with those people into the promised land. <laughs> I'm done with you people. <laughs> One of the things, too, that I often wonder about is, I think, People groups that have gone through suffering, like um, thinking of black slaves and you know early people in this country, and people who've gone through generations of suffering or you know living, especially people who believed in a, a god or somebody greater than themselves mm -hmm. and relying on that to make it better. I hear so many times from my black friends about you know looking at their prayers and their. Um, hopes and dreams and they they look more futuristically that culture looks at it like I don't care if I get it I want it to be for somebody else like I'm doing this whether or not it comes to be in my time, yes I'm doing this I for am. future generations and I, I think that. that's something I know I've if that's lost on me you know yeah because I feel like and that comes from that comes from privilege or from yeah having people that know how to make things happen or whatever and having that system yes. in place to make that happen but it's that's something I think that's really interesting is I know a lot of black women especially who have the capacity to go this isn't about me it's about my future generations it's about yes. people that come after me and I think wow that's a legacy a great yes mm -hmm. you know uh, we're focused on now yes and I've read before I think this tends to be true but there is much struggle in the current in, in present life, people tend to have a more, let's say, heavenly outlook, you know, looking forward to better time, or as you said, futuristic outlook. And when things are good for a particular people, they tend to, I think, just say, you know, enjoy the now, enjoy the present, live in the moment. <laughs> you know, one thing when we were reading the scripture that I thought about it probably doesn't have anything to do with it, but maybe God, Gabriel, whatever, yes. uh, you know, he wasn't going to be able to talk, and maybe, you know, here's this guy that was high up in the arche, ar in the, where did he say, you know, the high arche, uh, you know, heck, he'd been, he'd been chosen to stay in there, what, all year, or go in there once a year. Once and, a year, and yeah, all that that stuff. kind of an honor And then position. he didn't believe. You know, and here's the guy who should know all the scriptures and that it is going to happen, and he yeah. didn't believe it. Yeah. Uh, well, like you said earlier, I mean, <clears throat> it's just the humanness. It just helps us know we're all human. Right. doesn't matter if they're saints or if they later in life you know, or um, prophets or whatever. I mean, they all had times that they got it because it didn't seem humanly possible to do these things, but they always have to look to the fact that, you know, all with God all things are possible. Yeah. And, you know, we're just stubborn. And we're, I know. We're hard-headed. We don't, you know, we just think about the moment and yeah, we our think generation. We're expecting and, yeah. great things from yeah. God. And, uh, you know, are we dreaming big enough? Our expectations grand enough of what God can do and do we really believe that God will do the impossible in our lives or bring about circumstances 
that are amazing, you know. And so I, I think it is. We, we sometimes tend to forget that nothing is impossible with God. And um, so, uh, any other... Well, I think it's possible to think things might happen, but I can't believe it's really happening to me. <laughs> yeah, right, it finally happened. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You're just shocked. You're shocked when it does yeah. happen. Yeah. And then so then there are those people that have such confidence they're shocked if it doesn't happen to them. <laughs> and uh, so all kinds. But um, I think about and we think about Mary and Elizabeth. Mary I, I think are both very strong women. The scripture says that Mary left her home. For three months. Yeah, that it, was interesting. It is, yeah. and the, and she traveled. It doesn't say anybody traveled with her, but probably a distance of maybe seventy miles that she traveled to go see Elizabeth. So uh, that's just interesting to think about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Maybe you know, she had a companion with her, but well, we throughout the Bible, you're going to hear all kinds of things about things that people did that they shouldn't have been able to do <laughs> but God was with them clearly right right so that's the X factor maybe she thought well if I'm going to have the Messiah God's going to take care of me on this journey <laughs> right <laughs> well you know the other thing don't you think as people learned about her pregnancy and she wasn't married then, may, I mean, could she have left her home because she was afraid she would be shamed publicly? I mean, with yeah, the public eye. Yeah, I think that's a, a very realistic neighbors thing. and people. Three talking. months, she thought. We are more individualistic, much more. Mm -hmm. We're able to be. These people thought of the tribe and the family. You're right. And they didn't live very long, uh, truthfully. And so they thought of the, all those things as being part of the whole. And we tend to be really inward looking. It's me and mine, not even mine, it's just me. And, uh, yeah, much more That communal. isn't the way the world ran in those days. Yeah, and you know, I think it's, uh, our culture tends to, to prize individualism. You know, he pulled himself up by his own bootstraps, so she, you know, worked her way, you know, we we tend to forget that nobody does anything in isolation or in their own strength completely. There's always others that have helped in some way or another. But you're right, there was much more emphasis on community in Scripture, and I think God wants us to have that uh, communal outlook. I think you know, it doesn't really say much about that journey. It just said at that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country. And why do you think she went to Elizabeth? Elizabeth was a kinswoman. And how did Elizabeth's baby know that Mary was carrying the Lord? Yeah, well, that was definitely the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, had to be. right, right. But what was it? I mean, she probably could have. I mean, what? We don't have much about what went on during that time. Um, but if she was 70 miles away and they didn't have cell phones, she probably didn't know, you know, the condition of, of her until she got there. Yeah, there was some way she, she could have known that she was already pregnant. She might have gone there to think, well, I'll, you know, I'm pregnant, she's pregnant. I'll maybe learn something from her about being pregnant. Yeah, but and I'm she sure She didn't know till she got there. No, she knew. Did she? I mean, because the angel said, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child. Oh, okay. I yeah, that. she yeah. didn't know. There's a lot we covered today, so yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, easy okay. to yeah, forget some of it. But, um, she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. And this is part of the answer of how will this be? You know, when Mary asks how will this be? Well, even Elizabeth is pregnant. You know, nothing's impossible with God. And so I, I think that they drew strength from each other. 
and wisdom from each other. And it doesn't say that Mary was there for the birth, but it does say she stayed three months and Elizabeth was in her sixth month. So I feel like that Mary stayed through that time with Elizabeth, but you know, it's just my supposition. <laughs> yeah, why would you leave, right? Yeah, right before the baby yeah, came, you know. So then maybe they shared that time together. Um, I'm here, you need help, I'm leaving. Is that what you're yeah, doing? Right, right. Yeah. Well, I'm See out of here. <laughs> well, it's written by a man, he probably thought, oh, whatever, she has her baby. Yeah. <laughs> maybe Elizabeth was we'll there. We'll assume that happened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> would be very interesting. Well, you know, they were both celebrating a miracle. Yes. So that, I mean, that's something they couldn't share with very many women. You know, that was like two women. So nobody else understood what yeah. they were dealing with. I, I think that's real intimate. Yes, you know? I do too. And I feel like conversations <laughs> took place about, you know, what what is God doing in our lives and what, you know, we're part, we're part of something much bigger than ourselves. Um, and how they, you know, just as people do and... I think especially women draw strength from talking <laughs> and mm -hmm. from being together. And it's, that's not just, that's not unique to women, but I do think there is a, a bond there. And both of them seem accepting of what God has called them to. And both are favored, you know, we've spoken of as favored by God are blessed. But I am reminded that nobody in Scripture who is blessed by God and it, where it talks about that has an easy life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they were called to a difficult a task. Even with Jesus. all the beauty of the babies coming and um, their lives were not easy. And, you know, I think of Mary standing at the cross. Elizabeth, maybe she wasn't alive when John was murdered. I hope John went through that. But, um, you know, and I think about the way the children, you know, it's interesting, but the scripture says about both John and Jesus that they grew in wisdom and understanding. And... Uh, you know, but very different. It seems like John seems to stand out. We always think of him as kind of the maybe a little weird. <laughs> I always think about John. It's like um, that bugs and honey diet. It, it, yeah, right. Yeah, really. That you know, maybe he was a little bit spoiled early on because he was. You know, parents had waited for him so long, and so they kind of let him wear what he wanted to, and whatever. <laughs> yeah. But I, our time is up, and I need to turn this back over to Dennis. But thank you all for such a Thank you, Mark. 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 Thank you, Okay, we, we have two, uh, Doug Hill and Waco Hospital. Whoa. Yeah. Tell me more about that. With, uh, cancer and heart issues, critical. Uh, wow. Online. Very critical. Yeah. Uh, the outlook is not good. So you hear this from Ann? Yeah. And the family. And the family, yeah. 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 Where did you say Ann? Well, he used to be a member of this class. Yeah. No, no. No, Doug Hill and Ann Hill were just, just Mary, long time Mary, members. Mary. Yeah. Doug and Mary. They were members here a long time and then moved to Waco. Right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, Jesse Cohen, um, when she def defends her dissertation in New York. Okay. So your your daughter is defending her <coughs> dissertation in New York. Is that what it is? Tuesday. She flew in Thursday. Oh my goodness. That's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going up there? Aren't you going up there? Okay. For graduation. She doesn't want me there. Now. Does <laughs> understand. understand. Uh, other prayer requests. Do we have other ones? I know some of you came in, you, your, your greeters came in after the book went around, but any other prayer requests we have? I have an update. Uh, Merrick's little boy, Hayes, got through his heart surgery 
and uh, is in recovery. I think. I think we, uh, he came yes. home yesterday. Came home yesterday. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's a wonderful. Yeah. Thank God, a good doctor. So, any other prayer requests? Let's pray and go down. Thank you again, Lord. We appreciate you very much. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a time that we can read scripture about two women that um, were blessed by you and that served you well and delivered sons that were so influential in the in, in our life as Christians. Father, we thank you for their um, willingness to say yes and for um, the lives that they led. Thank you for the lesson that Margaret prepared for us and the scripture that we read today. We pray for Doug Hill and his wife Ann in, in, in Waco as he's fighting cancer and heart issues and is in critical condition. We thank, we um, pray for Jesse Cohen as she defends her dissertation in New York on Tuesday. And we have a prayer of thanksgiving and praise for Hayes, the son of Merrick and, and Catherine. Is, uh, he is home from the hospital after open heart surgery as a three-year-old and is um, doing well. Father, we thank you for Wilshire, thank you for our new pastor. We thank you for our staff. Help us to be your hands and feet in this part of the world. And let me pray. Amen. Amen.